when did you hang it up? So, I mean, I'm the, <laughs> I'm the poster boy for, uh, I'm, I'm done with swimming. Oh, I'm going to let it go and then come back. I, I actually stepped away from swimming. Um, I had some personal stuff that I had to deal with in 2002. And so I didn't, I didn't compete at all in 2002. I, I think there was a Commonwealth Games and there might have been one other, might have been a Pampax. Um, I started to come back to training in 2000 and I think the end of 2002. I think I made, was, was 2013 Worlds, where were they? Was that Barcelona? Barcelona, yeah. So I made that team and then made... Um, oh, wow. You swam for a while. Yeah, I was there for a while. Did you go to 08 Olympics? No. So that was my last... Uh, uh, Beijing Olympics was my... my That was it. I, I didn't make the final. I think I came fourth or fifth. It was like it was a blanket finish. It was really, really tight. At the trials. Um, at the trials, yeah. Mm. So I, I spent... Um, I didn't know what I was going to do after after Athens. I knew I was going to spend some time away, and and to be honest, I mean, I got a job. I was working at I was working as a croupier at, at Jupiter's Casino. You know, having a social life for the first time ever. You know, good bunch of friends, having a good time, and you know, like most athletes, just <clears throat> just no outlet, no outlet to challenge myself and and trigger those those high performance skills that I've got. And I remember making a decision to come back in two thousand and six specifically to try and make a third Olympics. And I think I started out swimming. I was at this stage, I was living in Broad Beach. So I started swimming with Glenn Baker at Southport and then ended up with Dennis. And then, so didn't make that, that team. And, and that was the end of the, the, the road for me. I realized at 31, this is going, this is going nowhere. I've got to sort of move on and made a pretty sort of um, aggressive sort of cut from the sport and, and you know, realized that I had to rebuild myself because I'd sort of semi tried to transition twice and it, it didn't work. So I knew I knew there was a whole lot of work that had to be done at a personal level. So sort of went about that and and um, actually started a business to help athletes transition from sport, which which was called Transports at the time, and, and worked with a couple of athletes and and that that sort of merged into something that I'm sort of kicking off shortly. So mm. so yeah, it, it was it was tough. Yeah, the transition side of things. It was. Um, it was hard. It's hard to let go, isn't it? You know, for sure. And and I didn't know yeah. when the right right time was either, you know, but I just, I got to a point where I, where I had some children, you know, I had my daughter when I was 23 and my son four years later. So by the time I was, was coming to the end of my career, I had, I had kids and, mm. and the rules with the Australian team, as you know, were, were, were kind of blanket, you know, pretty strict of like, all right, if we're going away, we're going away for a period of time and everybody has to live by the same rules. I remember going away at the age of 30 um, and, and being on the same team with 15, 16 year old girls and having to live yeah. by the same rules and thinking like, this sucks. Like, mm. I don't, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. It's not, it's just not pleasurable. I want to keep swimming, but this is not fun. So I, I pulled out that, that helped. And then having, having um, a situation where I hadn't finished my degree, I wanted to get that done. So, but the transition's tough, eh? Yeah. Like I, I um, and the mistake I'm, I've sort of made at a personal level, I was, I was engaged at the 2008 Olympics and I got married in October, 2008. Um, to my first wife and w two Christmases later, I remember she actually went up to Rockhampton and, and I was essentially home alone. And, and that's when I knew something was wrong. I, I was, I, I was sort of coming full face to, you know, the fact that I, you know, who was I, what was I, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And it's actually funny that I listened to on one of your podcasts with, um, the, the, who's the head coach at, at Virginia Tech, Sergio? What's Sergio Lopez, yeah. Lopez. I remember him saying, and this was just really, really hit home, where he said, you know, that the biggest, the biggest danger for an aspiring athlete is a performance breakthrough because up until that point, there's been sort of two developmental paths, the, the human development path, which is largely by default and experience, and then the athletic development path, which is, you know, where you're putting a lot of your time to and where you're getting a lot of your results. If, if you have, if you don't, basically what he was saying is if you don't have some sort of system or process to continue to develop yourself as a, as a person, mm -hmm. the minute you hit that breakthrough, your affirmation now becomes entirely athletic. Right. And that is, there's no coming back from that. Once you're buried in that sort of mindset where what you do is who you are, mm -hmm. transition is an incredibly difficult, difficult process. But if you can manage to understand that, there's the athlete 
Josh, and there's the human being, Josh, and actually the development, if you develop both sides of you, naturally as an athlete you're doing, but if you develop the human side of you, that is actually a massive plus to the athlete. Then when, you know, the athlete side, you know, leaves your life, you've still got this core principle of who you are as a person. And I think that's the secret to, to a, a good transition. And, and that's why, you know, I think Chris did such a good job. Well, what you said just there is what every single athlete's going to face, you know, and we, yep. we, we see an athlete like maybe, uh, I don't know personally, but Cleek Keller, you know, who <laughs> just found himself in, in trouble, you know, may, yep. maybe still just wandering and trying to, trying to find connections and got lost in a group that shouldn't have been lost in, but just, yeah, but, but every athlete's going to have to face those questions. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and like you said, those affirmations are just so <laughs> powerful when you have success as a swimmer and, and then you, and then you desire it and want that again. And you, and it's like in swimming, there's a period of time where you can just train and train and train. Training feels amazing. You know, you're not under that type of cutthroat pressure, yeah. but then, then once or twice a year, you have to put yourself out there and expose yourself. But that's the, the training gives you enough um, time to feel secure, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and that's definitely a tough process. But for sure. And the, you know, the great thing about sport is if you stuff up in the morning, you've got the night. Yeah. And if you stuff up in the night, you've got the morning, you know, like, um, you know, I, I remember, you know, when I started to develop this transports business, I, I, I did some, I did my own sort of research a lot with a lot of swimmers who'd retired. And a lot of the, the data that was coming out was that less than 50% of athletes feel some sort of emotional, um, you know, perturbation post transition. And that was like, I was getting in the high nineties and, and so I knew there was a need there. And I thought, okay, you know, at, at, when we were athletes going through the system, they're trying to educate us, get a degree. And, and I thought, well, I don't think that's, that's not enough. We need to, we're high performance athletes. We need to be, or we're high performance people. We need to be operating at high performance. That's where we're most comfortable. Um, then, you know, transports was all about getting these athletes post-sport. And, and I was convinced that that was the way to do it. And then, you know, the outcomes were good, but they could have been better. And then I thought, okay, well, how do we get them before they've transitioned from sport? And there's this sort of crescendo that's built up into, okay, this is my last tournament. This is my last competition, my last opportunity to, to do something great. No, you know, I'm too anxious around transition. I'm not ready for it yet. And then, you know, you hear something like what Sergio said, and the, the key is to get right back to the, to the start. And that could be as young as 12, 13, 14, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and planting this idea that there are, you know, it's, it's not just for when you leave sport that, you know, you, you need to stand on something. You need to have value away from what it is that you're doing so that you can stand on that when you're no longer an athlete, but you have to start developing that now. And Hey, guess what? If you do that, you'll be a better athlete in, in any sense. Did you seek outside help to help you come to those conclusions? Yeah, hundred percent. I, I had a counselor for a while. Um, I had a, a guy who's a, a business mentor who's, who's still, uh, you know, I'm in, in, you know, periodic contact, you know, once or twice a year. Um, you know, I remember Chris saying, you know, don't, don't ever not let, don't, don't ever not fall back on what it is that you've achieved in sport and allow that to give you the springboard that you need in, in, you know, later life. I probably took it a little bit too far. I, I really, disassociated with you know who i was as an athlete and to the point where i would just refuse to you know acknowledge anything that i'd done in sport to a new relationship or anything mm. like that oh, wow. and I, I think i think i took it too far but if i wouldn't have changed it if i was to go back because it made me develop myself it forced me to find the holes that i had at a personal level and start to you know build some uh, substance around around that you know so um right yeah yeah is there any advice in terms of someone that might be listening to this right now so in having in, instead of having to go through that whole process you went through is there anything that you would you know advise them on on doing now yeah i just think understanding that you're essentially two two people that you there's an athletic side to you but but you're you're a human being first before you're an athlete and and you know you know coming back to self-awareness as a as 
you know, self, self-awareness, you know, I know who I am and I know how to get the best out of myself. You know, they've done studies on what is the key factor that, that separates no matter what it is that you do, what industry, you know, what skill set. Self-awareness is the defining character that people have. And that, that has to be de- developed. And if you can develop that as early as you can, and, you know, if you're like, like Bruno now, um, you know, he, he, my, my advice to him would be to start, to start now. Yeah. It doesn't have to be contradictory or in competition to what you're doing in your athletic arena. It's actually complementary. It will actually mm-hmm. make you a better athlete. Yeah, I agree with that because it provides some balance of some sort. It doesn't have to be a 50-50 yeah. balance, but yeah. it, it takes your mind away from all that stuff that is just building up athletically and gives you some sort of identity on the other side. And I think that's yeah. it is like just figuring out who else you are other than just this athlete, you know, yeah. um, who who else, what are your other interests? What are your other likes? What are your other passions? What what is, what is places in your life that you can give back as well you know yeah I, I laugh because i remember i remember a, a situation I, I remember you know i lived in brisbane for a period of time i remember being in my walk-in road and you know like when you're an athlete you, you're very critical you're always looking to progress nothing's ever good enough all of that sort of stuff and i remember being in the i remember getting dressed one day and it just dawned on me i just i just went i'm a negative person <laughs> it just came to me but instantly i went well, I'm going to do something about it. Mm. You know, like I didn't, I didn't wallow in, you know, life is, you know, this job sucks, you know, you know, I'm not getting paid enough here. You know, this person doesn't appreciate me. I just went enough, you know, like, like admit where you are now and you can move forward from that. Yeah. Yeah. We do. We do develop kind of this, I don't know what is like this poor me attitude. Like it's like you have this chip on your shoulder as an athlete, Mm. especially one that isn't, um, maybe as as dominant i don't don't know i was never i was never the person that was dominating the world i always felt like the underdog kind of thing you have that underdog mentality where it's like you know everything's working against me for some reason it's it's not you know you're working against yourself ultimately (laughs) yeah and i think that you know it sort of comes to mind you know another you know what separates the, the best athletes in the world they've got no time for judgment you know the training session doesn't go as well as they they planned they don't they don't you know, they don't pity themselves. They don't sit in their own misery that it wasn't good enough. They take what they learned out of that experience and they move forward without judgment. So they're not fear of, they're not, they don't have any fear of mistakes or errors because, you know, their emotional response to things not going as they had planned, it just, it's so quickly removed from their thought process. 